Good morning and welcome to our worship on this little bit chilly January morning. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 96. Sing and bless the Lord's name. Tell the glad news of salvation from day to day. Proclaim the Lord's glory to all nations, God's marvelous deeds to all people. Let's pray together. Holy God, You sent Your Son to be baptized among sinners, to seek and to save the lost. May we who have been baptized in His name never turn away from the world, but reach out in love to rescue the wayward by the mercy of Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with You and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. I don't have much in the way of announcements. Well, actually, I do have two. Uh, Next week, uh, immediately after worship, there will be a joint meeting of elders and deacons uh, to consider uh, the budget for 2021. And then following that meeting, uh, that budget will be sent out to the congregation and a congregational meeting will be held on the last Sunday in January, January 31st, I believe, uh, immediately following worship to adopt uh, that budget. Other than that, uh, Men's Community Bible Study continues uh, at the Benea Ministries building on Scooch Davis Road every Thursday morning at uh, 7 o'clock. Let's go to the Lord in a time of confession. Let's pray together, pleading our hearts before His very throne. Creator God, at the beginning of time, You created a day of rest. A sign pointing forward into the eternal rest that we will share with You forever. You now ask Your people to set aside one day in seven to rest and to worship, to remember our deliverance from bondage of sin, and to know that all our needs come from Your hands. We thank You for Your precious gift, yet we misuse it in so many ways. For some of us, this is a day to keep rules, impress others with our piety, and parade our righteousness instead of needing Yours. We dress our bodies for church while our hearts are cold. Filled with pride and self-sufficiency, we display our spiritual victories for others to admire, yet we don't confess the sinfulness of our struggle with moment-to-moment sin. We memorize Your Scripture and catechisms. We lift our hands to You in prayer. We serve energetically, relying on our own goodness as though it could ever satisfy You. Father, forgive us. For some of us, Sunday is a day like any other day, a day to catch up on work, to play, to recreate with no thought to You, no desire to make worship and fellowship a priority. We foolishly believe that we can love You well on our own without brothers and sisters with whom we have called <clears throat> you have called us to walk through life we feel a little awe and reverence for you or gratitude for all you've done our appetite for your word is small while our belief in our understand in our own understanding looms large we are wise in our own eyes and we fail to see the consequences of our selfishness and immature behavior. Lord, have mercy on us. Holy Spirit, correct our thinking and strengthen our souls. We are blind and deserving of your own uh, punishment, but open our eyes and show us our hearts. Remind us of the love of Christ until our hearts are humbly drawn to hunger for God's Word. Father, Forgive us of our many sins. Rescue us from 
the terror of our own hearts. For we ask it in our Savior's name. Amen. Our catechism question today is uh, question 12 from the New City Catechism. What does God require in the ninth and tenth commandments? The answer, of course, is that the ninth, that we do not lie or deceive, but speak the truth in love. And the tenth, that we are content, not envying anyone or resenting what God has given them or us. The scripture that supports this is given here is James 2.8. If you really really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Blessed be God's word as found in the catechism that we should all study and grow in. Our Old Testament reading this morning is Psalm 29, a Psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders Over the mighty waters, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace.
Our New Testament uh, reading this morning uh, comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. John the Baptist prepares the way. And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. Blessed be the reading and the hearing of God's holy word. Johnny, as we come to our prayer time this morning, let me uh, be encouraging to all of you, uh, whether you're here or online or however you might be listening, to uh, be doing uh, faithfully, uh, I would pray for you, your Bible reading. Uh, we are reading chronologically through God's Word this year which means that after a couple of days in <clears throat> Genesis, uh, you got shipped to Job. And uh, you've been struggling, uh, perhaps, uh, these last several days in Job. Uh, take heart. Um, it won't be as long as it's been, uh, perhaps, in reading Job. That will be done soon. Uh, Job is a great book. And it is a great book at the end. But you got to get through all the Hebrew poetry to get there. And uh, so hang in there. Uh, I have uh, made a commitment this year. I got a Bible that I usually uh, don't use. It's actually uh, one that was on my shelf. I put it next to my chair. And I have so enjoyed reading in a Bible where I don't have notes scribbled and I don't have references and study notes i just have god's word and i have been thoroughly enjoying going through uh, that particular reading plan uh, so far this year uh, they say three or four weeks to make a habit and so i hope that you will hang in there for another few weeks and make this a habit of your uh, daily plan as we come to our congregational prayer time, I certainly want to pray for that. Uh, we want to pray for um, our local hospital, which has been overwhelmed uh, with COVID patients uh, in the last several weeks. Um, some folks just not getting a break really at all. Um, certainly, I would ask you to pray for Mr. Leroy who is in the final hours, uh, Leroy Lewis, who is in the final hours of his journey from this world into the light of eternity. He has been a faithful servant of this church for many years. I believe he was an elder um, at one point uh, in time here um, and has served faithfully. Uh, I could always count on Mr. Leroy uh, coming early for Sunday school and uh, going back to the choir room and playing one or two of the few songs that he still could remember uh, just out of rote memory to play and listening to him back there. 
Certainly, uh, we want to pray for our country uh, in this time of uh, not only transition in terms of our government, but in the, the, uh, uh, the midst of such craziness. Um, we just want to pray for peace and for civility. I received, uh, well, a couple other things. Uh, several of you have asked about Spencer, my daughter, my middle child, whose surgery for her ACL, her fourth one, was uh, this week. She's doing pretty good. Uh, I talked to her this morning by text, and uh, she has uh, uh, continues to recover at home and is doing okay. Also received word uh, this morning that someone who has preached in this church, Peter Wade, who is the ARP pastor in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Uh, we have prayed for him in recent days. Uh, he lost his foot to uh, diabetic complications uh, and lower leg. Uh, but Peter has been, um, has, his family has endured a good bit of loss in the last little bit. His father-in-law um, was a great man in the ARP, uh, Reverend Code, and his wife have both died in recent months, but uh, Peter's in the hospital with complications from COVID, and uh, so we need to pray for uh, his uh, his church there in Spartanburg, and uh, and and certainly for he and his wife Anne who has uh, COVID uh, as well. We do have much to rejoice though about. Uh, Vaccine shots are happening. Uh, God is still at work saving people each and every day. And so we don't want to become depressed, uh, but we should uh, be mindful, right? And as many uh, who would normally worship with us uh, are not here uh, for um, uh, reasons of COVID or perhaps travel today, uh, we just need to be uh just super cautious is let all I can do uh, to say to you uh, this morning. Let's go to the Lord in time of prayer. Father God, as we come this morning lifting before you our praise and our, our worship as we've gathered here together and lifted our prayers of confession before you as we've opened and read your word as we will shortly open and preach your word. Father, this is our time when we come and plead before Your throne uh, the cares of our hearts. And so, Father, in this moment of silence, hear the cries of our own hearts. Uh, as we all have pain, we all have needs uh, that we would lift before Your throne. Father God, I do pray for those on the front line of the battle against the surge in COVID-19, the hospital workers, the firefighters, the police officers, the ambulance workers. Father, as I heard this morning, uh, first responders called to a house where four people were positive for covid They put themselves in harm's way. Those who care for the sick in hospitals, Father, we do pray for them. We pray for Your protection upon them. We pray for Your encouragement and energy for them. And we would pray that Your, your very angels would surround them. Lord, we do pray for Mr. Leroy Lewis this morning that as he awaits to enter his reward, as he closes his eyes soon and opens them into a glorious scene, we do pray for him that your angels would bear him gently and graciously 
to His eternal rest. Father, bless the Lewis family and those who are ministering to Mr. Leroy, his caregivers who have been so supportive and sweet and kind to him through the years. Father, we pray for them. Pray for Charles and Suzanne and Karen here as they tend to him that you would be with them as well. Father, we pray for Peter Wade and all who are in the hospital with COVID. We pray that you would make the vaccines uh, work, that you would enable the surge to die down. Father, we do pray for our country as we've seen the ravages of sinfulness this week, O oh Lord as we seek to find hope where hope cannot be found, as we sought to find answers horizontally rather than vertically, Father, we pray that You would bless our country, that You would bring peace. Father, that You would lead us to repentance, that You would lead us to seeking Your face even more. That we would not find answers in political parties or movements or personalities, but in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. And Father, we would pray that our hearts would be as animated by the Gospel as it is by the news. That we would be stirred up for the cause of Christ. Father, we ask that as our leaders come together next week to uh, vote on a budget, and then as a congregation meets, that we would form a budget that would be pleasing and bring glory to You. For we ask all of this in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. As I mentioned last week, uh, Romans 9 through 11 are some of the most challenging parts of all of Scripture. Certainly, the doctrine of election, which is honestly found throughout the entire Bible, is a challenging doctrine. Some believe that's all we talk about as Presbyterians or as Reformed believers is election. 
I hope what's true in that statement is that all we talk about is grace. But while it is true that it is found throughout all of Scripture, it is also equally true that many people, some people at least, refuse to accept it or if they don't want to go so far as to refuse to accept it since it's so blatant in Scripture, they want to at least water it down. All of the apostles wrote, that wrote, wrote about it, all the great theologians of the Reformation certainly taught it. Our confession of faith is very open about it as well. But to believe that it's biblical is, um, is one thing. But to have questions, ah, that's another, isn't it? You may accept it because God's Word teaches it, but you may still have questions about it. And that's, I hope what you take from today's sermon is that's okay. To have the right kind of questions uh, about it. Paul certainly teaches it here in chapter 9. We're going to stand together to read God's Word as we do each week, as they did in the days of Ezra. So we will do. Um, I owe you one bit of explanation. Um, I threw Jennifer a little bit of a curveball. I'm going to actually begin in verse 8. So if you have your Bible, you can follow along in verse 8. If you have your bulletin, which has it there, hang on, we'll get to verse 10 in just a second. Hear the word of the Lord. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I'll return and Sarah will have a son. Now, if you're looking in your bulletin, you can pick up here. Not only that, but Rebekah's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand... Not by works, but by him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. Just as written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For the Scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom He wants to have mercy, and He hardens whom He wants to harden. One of you will say to me, Why then does God still blame us? For who can resist His will? But who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to Him who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes, and some for common use. God bless the reading and the hearing of this, Your Word, O Lord. But may we see no man save Christ alone, for it's in His name we ask it. Amen. Be seated.
Paul begins his defense of the doctrine of election in several ways in several different uh, books, as do other uh, biblical writers. Proverbs 16, 4 says, The Lord works out everything for His own ends, even for a day of disaster. John 12, 39 and 40 says, For this reason... They could not believe because, as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts so that they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn, and I would heal them. John thirteen eighteen, Jesus says, I know those I have chosen. Second Peter uh, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 7 and 8 says, Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and the stone that causes men to stumble, a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is, uh, which is also... Uh, what they were destined for. Jude, verse 4. Certainly those men whose condemnation was written of long ago have secretly slipped in among you. And then, of course, we have Romans 4. Or Romans 9. And as we come to Romans 9, uh, where we kind of started, if we could go all the way back to uh, verse 6, uh, we would see that Paul lists here <clears throat> three generations of election. Now, I find his argument compelling and fascinating. Yes, God did pick a nation, the nation of Israel. But His sovereign election, hear me when I say this, His sovereign election is assigned individually, extends to individuals, as we will see here in His Word. Abraham, the great patriarch, was not a believer in God. He was a heathen. His father was a maker of idols. And God chose this man of all the peoples of the earth to start His nation, Israel. Paul is saying that all the natural children of Abraham are not children of the promise. Are not elect. God's mercy and election extends only to the spiritual children of Abraham, the children of the promise, the children of the covenant. You remember the story, Abraham is promised to have more descendants than the sand on the sea or the stars in the sky. And yet, Sarah is barren, and so Sarah gives him one of his, her maids, and Ishmael is the offspring. But Ishmael is not elect. It is only when Sarah becomes pregnant and Isaac is born is that the child of the promise. And the question is, after picking Abraham, does God continue, follow me here, does God continue to pick some Jews for salvation and not others? Does He pick some Gentiles for salvation and not 
others. Yes, Abraham had two sons, but only one was with Sarah. Isaac, the child of the promise. But, here's, here's where some people want to argue, and they say, yes, but Ishmael was not a true child of the covenant because his mother was not of the nation of Israel, of the family of Abraham. And so perhaps it's still a national election and not an individual salvation election applied to the individual. But Paul is not finished here. Verse 10 says that Rebekah children were pure Jews. She and Isaac were both Jewish, both of Abraham's extended family. But then look at verse 11 through 13. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose in election might stand not by works, but by Him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, and Esau I hated. Esau and Jacob out of God's holy counsel and will. Paul quotes here Malachi 1.23 Jacob I loved. Esau I hated. Hard to read the Bible sometime, isn't it? Verse 11 makes it makes it so crystal clear that before either of the twins were born, and remember that also in God's economy, the older was the child that was dedicated to God. He was the one who, the older son was always the one who got double the inheritance, but yet here the younger, the, the second born twin is the one who is chosen. And verse 11 says, Before either twin had done anything good or bad, but only for God's purpose in election, Jacob is chosen and Esau is rejected. Election is never, hear me please, Election to salvation and eternal life with Christ is never based on anything in us or that we do. It is all in God's mercy. Scripture makes it very clear. Election is for nations, yes, but more specifically, election in terms of salvation, is always individual. Always individual. And it is always up to God. Never to you. This is the whole idea behind radical depravity, right? The T in tulip, if you will, total depravity. A better way to say it is radical depravity. We are radically depraved as sinners and we cannot reach out to God. Abraham never would have chosen God in his wildest imagination. He could not even imagine a life with God had God not chosen him. But now, my dear friends, now we come to the dark side. And that dark side 
is reprobation. Those who are not elect, whose names are not written in the book of life, what about them? Well, here is where even more people struggle with election. The idea that God, the doctrine that God rejects some people to eternal to their eternal damnation. Jacob I have loved. Esau I have hated. So let's look at the negative side of election for a few minutes this morning. Let's be brave and bold enough to see what Paul is really saying here. Reprobation. Some don't like the word hated here. Jacob I have loved. They're all good with that, but Esau I have hated. They want to they water that down. Yes, God hates sin, but He never hates anybody. They also don't like really the idea of God actively hardening a heart. And yet, we find it in the pages of Scripture. We don't use a word that I first encountered as a young man in my church that I was born into. And that phrase or word is double predestination. We don't really like to use that word anymore, both as theological term or just in general society terms of discussing this, because it, it shows one of the flaws in the thinking with election. And let me explain what I mean by that. When we say double predestination, that is that God predestined some to grace and salvation and predestines others to eternal damnation, that creates a false understanding for you and for me. Because God, bear with me here, God does not stand behind predestination of the elect and the reprobate in the same way. Now let me explain what I mean by that. Let me, in fact, quote Boyce here. He says, Do we say then that God determines the destinies of individuals in exactly the same way so that without any consideration of what they might do, He assigns one to heaven and one to hell? Is that what we're saying? Well, Paul makes it clear that that is not what we're saying. It is only by mercy and not by anything within the individual that He assigns some to heaven. I want you to see that here. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Election to eternity with Christ is by grace alone and of God's mercy alone. Now that part will grasp. That part will understand. That part will frankly, accept. But does God assign others to hell apart from anything they have done, apart from deserving it? That's the question, isn't it? Does He throwing darts at the dartboard? Is it by God's whim that you go to heaven 
or by his whim that you go to hell. Well, the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 3, section 7, helps us so much here. Both election and reprobation flow from the eternal counsels of God. It teaches us rather than from our will. And both, hear me when I say this, both reprobation and election to eternal life are both always for God's glory. The confession uses some language that I think will be helpful to us this morning. Our confession uses the term God passes by some. That He elects some to salvation and passes by others. And in just a minute, I'm going to help you see why that's a really helpful phrase. Some are saved only because God for some reason in His holy counsel, chooses to intervene in that life and save that person and not do that to the next. But you see, here's the difference. Everybody, all of us, deserve to go to hell. That's radical depravity. You deserve to go to hell. I deserve to go to hell. And the fact that God would, out of His mercy and grace, save some is to His glory. But for all those that He passes by, they, listen, they are condemned to hell because of their own sin. God never sends any guiltless people to hell. And, I would add, everybody that will eventually be in hell is, hell, is in hell because they deserved it. And they wanted to be there. Because they wanted to follow their own sin more than they wanted to follow Jesus Christ. We would all, apart from God's mercy in election, be there. God has never sent anyone to hell on a whim. Everyone who is there eternally is there because they deserve it. Both election and reprobation bring glory to God. Now, let me pause here as we're kind of steaming towards our, our time being gone. Let me pause and give you two objections to election that I hear all the time. And hopefully show you how one is a solid question and one is the wrong question to ask. Let's do the wrong one first. How many times have I heard, shouldn't God show mercy to everyone? I mean, after all, if He shows mercy to anybody, shouldn't He show mercy to everybody? <clears throat> shouldn't He just save everybody? Is it right of God, I hear, to save some and not others? Let me show you why that's a wrong question to ask. As soon as you say, shouldn't God, or 
isn't it wrong of God, you're entering into a judgment statement about God. When you say, shouldn't God save everybody if He saves anybody, you're using the word, in essence, ought. Ought God not to do this rather than that. The word should implies obligation, perhaps. Obligation has to do with justice. If God is just, shouldn't He do this? Shouldn't He do that? Trust me, my dear congregation, we do not want God's judgment. We only want God's mercy. When we say that, we are calling into question God's justice and we are imposing upon Him a narrative of what we think is right over against what God's Word teaches. Now let me give you the better question to ask. The better question to ask is, why doesn't God show mercy to everyone? There's a gulf of difference between shouldn't God show mercy to everyone and why doesn't God show mercy to everyone? I don't know the answer to that good question. It is a legitimate question to ask. And why is it legitimate? Because we're looking to understand God's character. We're looking for understanding of who He is and how His glory operates. We're not imposing upon Him how we think He should act. Verse 15 simply says of God, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Honestly, if I was going to be open with all of you and transparent this morning, the question I would ask is not, why doesn't God show mercy to everyone? It would be, why does God show mercy to anyone? When I think of the sinfulness of my own heart and that Christ died for me I am overwhelmed his glory is made manifest in all that he does whether it's showing his mercy or his justice but remember one thing that even on those that he shows mercy and elects to eternal life his justice is not thwarted his justice is not set aside no, the wrath of God is not poured out on that individual that He elects. It is poured out on Christ. And so His justice in election is always satisfied. And His mercy shows up in your heart and in your mind and in your life in salvation. Again, verse 16 takes us back to God's mercy, reminding us that our salvation does not depend on our desire or our effort, but on Christ and Christ alone. Let me close this morning with a couple of points that Jonathan Edwards, the great American theologian and preacher of a, another era, he preached on Romans 18. And he made several really important points that I just want to list for you this morning. The first is that God's sovereignty is His absolute and independent right of disposing with all His 
creatures according to his own will and pleasure. Let me repeat that. God's sovereignty is his absolute and independent right of disposing of all his creatures according to his own will and pleasure. The second point that Edward made quickly is that in salvation, God is perfectly within his right to give or refuse salvation. And then Edwards makes this fascinating statement. He says that when God doesn't save someone, He is not in any way dishonoring His holiness. Thirdly, God exercises His sovereignty in multiple ways, in nations, in people, and in events. And lastly, as I have said, all of this is for God's glory alone. Verses 19 through 21 close out our time here. And I won't reread them for sake of time. But in there we have a question, an answer, and an illustration. A question, an answer, and an illustration. And I hope that you'll perhaps take a moment and look at 19 through 21 at home. There are three contrasts here in this question, answer, and illustration. The first one is God and man. We are created by God. He's the creator. He's the ruler of all even if someone does not believe in God's absolute right of authority and election, it doesn't make it not true. It's still true, whether you accept it or not. Secondly, that there's the difference between the formed and the one who forms. We are the clay, the dust of the earth. It is the potter who is God. Robert Haldane wrote, listen to this, is it not an insult to the Creator to find imperfection with His proceedings? When we seek to understand God more, we see correctly. When we question God's actions as unfair we're finding fault with Him. And lastly, the potter and the clay. God is free to mold and make us in any way He sees fit. My brothers and sisters, grace and mercy of God are on display in both election and reprobation. And His glory is the most important thing of all. Do I have questions about election? Yes. Do I have questions about reprobation? Yes. Do I understand it at all? No. But I know it's what Scripture teaches. And I know one day while I see in the mirror darkly now, one day I will see face to face. And I will understand it all. And so my task now is to seek to understand Him more by being in His Word. Not to question whether He is fair or unfair, just or unjust, but to give Him great glory. Amen. Father, uh, tough passages here, Lord. But it is Your Word, and it is Your teaching, and it is Your way. And You are the potter. We are merely the dust of the earth. Incline our hearts 
to give you the glory in all of this, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for the benediction. Now to the King eternal, the immortal, the invisible, the only God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen.